I was seven years old when I decided to make my mother's life an unending nightmare. At that age, I had come to the realization that I longed for the companionship of a husky mutt puppy. In math class, I daydreamed about rescuing a noble arctic canine from its snowy prison in Alaska and pampering it with affection in the warmer climates of my hometown. I would name her Amundsen after the famous Arctic explorer, and in July I would take her outside, look into her blue eyes, and shave her fur down to a short coat so she wouldn't succumb to heat exhaustion. She would bury ice cubes in the backyard and yelp in puzzlement when she tried to dig them up the next day, only to find they were missing. In winter, we would play fetch, and I would watch her tiny body leap in and out of the snow as she bounced across frozen fields to retrieve our tennis ball. But my mother would not allow it. For this reason, I ended our mutual companionship forever. When watching television together and a dog appeared on screen, I often made a despondent sigh to corrode at my mother's psyche like waves against a rock. When we went to the park together, I sought out people walking their dogs, rushed over to them, and asked if I could pet her. I would run my palm along her gentle coat, and my face would glow with joy that I refused to feign for my mother whenever she pointed a camera at me. When passing the school for the blind, I always pointed out the seeing eye dogs, wrapped in their neon harnesses, and let my mother know how well behaved and how well trained they were. Once a week, I asked for a husky mutt puppy. Twice a week, I told her I was the only kid in school without a pet. Three times a week, I went out with a plastic bag and collected random dog turds so that I might feel some proximity towards dog ownership. Whenever she asked me where I was going, I replied, to the pet store, and I would go there and look at the dogs and long. Husky Mutt Puppy became my default answer to every question. If my mother asked how my day was, my reply was, it would be better with a Husky Mutt Puppy. If she asked what I wanted for dinner, my reply was, Pemmican is what Arctic explorers fed their husky mutt puppies. If she asked me what I learned in school, my reply was, I wish I had a husky mutt puppy. When we went to the doctor, I asked him if depression could be caused by a lack of husky mutt puppy in one's life. When on a field trip to the aquarium, I held a horseshoe crab and wondered aloud what holding a husky mutt puppy would be like. Unaware that my mother was not chaperoning, and my moping was for naught. It came to the point where my mother stopped talking to me. I came home from school after a day that was distinctly lacking in its husky mutt puppy population to find that my mother had bolted my bedroom door shut, and behind it, I could hear something gently clawing at the door. My arm went numb with excitement. I tasted copper on my tongue and perspired. My mother came sheepishly with the key and told me that she had it with my longing for a husky mutt puppy. It was all I ever talked about, she said, and imitated my epithets about how I had no blue-eyed husky to go slaying with and how I longed to pick up turds which belonged to my very own husky mutt puppy. So while I was at school, she had gone to the pet shop and finally got me something. I opened my arms so when the door swung free, Amundsen could leap into my arms. But instead, there was only a throbbing mass of black hair wedged in the corner of my room, fidgeting anxiously. Was it a bear? A woolly giraffe in a fetal position? A massive, hulking tangle of limbs and fur? It looked back at me with six bowling ball-sized eyes, twitching its calicera and heaving its body. When the spindly legs began to reach out, I screamed as loud as I could, recognizing the creature's terrible visage. It's a tarantula, my mother said. The biggest kind in the world, over ten feet tall, can you believe it? I was too busy screaming to reply. After the spider hellbeast had been safely quarantined behind the door, I was able to stop hyperventilating. I was going to tell her to take it back, that this was not my husky mutt puppy, that I would never love this abomination against pet ownership. 
My mother foresaw all of this before I could say a single word, and the following torrent spewed from her mouth. Don't you dare tell me this tarantula isn't good enough for you. You're not entitled to have a pet. Stop complaining about how lonely you are when I went out and bought you this fantastic ten-foot-tall tarantula. And then she stormed out of the house to her yoga class. I named it Robert Falcon Scott, after the Arctic explorer who starved to death. My mother didn't want it scurrying around the house, messing up the ceiling and knocking things over, so it was confined to my bedroom. Robert Falcon Scott liked to share the bed with me. He would be the big spoon. I would be the little spoon shivering and sweating in fear until sunrise. When I wanted to be alone, I let Robert Falcon Scott outside and watch it climb into the elm tree in the front yard and disappear. People stopped walking by our house after word of Robert Falcon Scott's existence became widespread. I had to talk to the post office to get our mail from then on. Ordering Girl Scout cookies became a real hassle. I had to feed Robert Falcon Scott twice a day. I would go out to the animal shelter and ask which dogs were about to be euthanized and then pick two victims to come home with me. I took them to the park. I played fetch with them. I petted them and rolled around in the dirt with them. Sometimes if I jumped into the pond, they followed and we would dog paddle together. Then I would take them home, give them to Robert Falcon Scott. They always looked at me with the eyes that called out my betrayal. I only watched it eat once. It would wrap up the dog in a web, bite it, and inject it with some sort of hellish mucus to melt the dog from the inside out. Then Robert Falcon Scott devoured it like a sinister hot pocket. Sometimes when I'm in bed with Robert Falcon Scott, my mind conjures up memories of its awful spider lips smacking together and slurping dog flesh. Once Robert Falcon Scott learned to open doors, it often surprised me in the most unusual places. I would be taking a shower, and when shampooing my hair and tilting my head to look up at the ceiling, he would look down at me with its terrible bowling ball eyes. He would wait for me in the kitchen. When I went into the garage to get my bike, he would be there. When digging for fossils under the house's crawl space, he hunted me and crept silently near. My mother got angry at me for screaming so much. I eventually lost my voice. It may come back one day, years from now. I hope. I hated Robert Falcon Scott. When I went to the dog shelter to pick up his latest meal, I selected the tiniest and most sickly dogs available. Chihuahuas with missing legs, bony French poodles, Rabid Pomeranians. I wanted it to starve and die. I wanted to be rid of it forever, and the emaciated dogs I fed it would be my method. Spiders don't lose weight, though, even when they're ten feet tall. Midway through my campaign to destroy Robert Falcon Scott, one of the neighbors came to me and accused it of eating their Welsh corgi. It probably did. It's not like I can keep a leash on that thing. The neighbor called me an asshole, forgetting that I was only seven years old. And then she told me I looked like shit. Probably because I wasn't getting much sleep. I was making a food run to the animal shelter when I realized it was unusually silent. Whenever I show up, there's always a pandemonium of yelping, yapping, yipping, yammering mutts, throwing themselves into cage doors, urinating on the floor, crunching on kibbles, scratching at plastic doors... But there was none of that now. The volunteer there told me that Robert Falcon Scott had single-handedly eradicated the overpopulation of stray dogs in the neighborhood. So they only had one dog left to give me. He brought me over to a Siberian husky. It looked at me with a calm and noble demeanor. Like a marquise led to the guillotine. And I thought of what could have been between us told the volunteer I couldn't feed that dog to that thing. Why not? 
We're just going to euthanize it anyway. I asked him if he knew what principles were. And then one day, Robert Falcon Scott ate Mom. I didn't see it happen, which is probably for the best. I did see that horrible thing eating one of its carnal hot pockets, and I noticed that the animal wrapped up in its spiderweb tortilla was larger than usual. But I didn't piece together that it could have been her until a day later when I noticed she was missing. I may have wanted my mother to suffer for never letting me have a husky mutt puppy, but I never would have wanted her killed. I didn't even like having the dogs killed. My therapist thinks I may have repressed the memory. But if I did, I hope it stays that way. At her funeral, Father Little put his hand on my shoulder and said, These things happen. To be lonely is a terrible thing. We're not built for it. We each need someone to lick our face and smile when we come home. If we have nothing else, at least we have that. But there's a smile that I don't long to see, and I see it every day. A carnivorous smile on a thing that never feels love. It lives in my home. It has robbed from me my family and my future. Before Robert Falcon Scott's veterinarian was decapitated, he told me that these particular spiders could live to be 400 years old. I imagine my future. I'm old, bald, and frail, shuffling around a nursing home, and that ungodly thing is still with me, outside, inside, at the foot of my bed. What did I do to deserve this fate, I wonder? And now, this terrible inheritance is mine. <laughs>